Merry Christmas family Welcome to Talk Truth This is episode number 45 And I'm your boy Mario Evan And you don't know our Christmas time And we love how it go already Today we speak about a topic That really is so relevant to 2020 Because we've been through a whole lot And I speak to my friend Who is a life coach A spinning instructor A diving instructor A mother entrepreneur About her experience with the quality that we refer to as resilience. Quite an interesting episode. I was really so happy that she was able to be so candid and share so much about her life. So spend some time with me today and check it out. Me love you like mango. Singing is one thing I wish I could do. I sing in the shower a lot. A lot of people want to sing, I realize. I do sing. I just don't like people hearing it because... Because cause you don't think it's good enough, but not because it's not good. <laughs> Guys, welcome to another episode of Talk Truth. And guess where I am? I am in the live store JA with none other than Natalie Mori. And as usual, I like to let my guests introduce themselves because that way I don't have to remember their bios. <laughs> but no, you know yourself best. Natalie, tell us what you do and who you are. I am a health coach. Um, I guess that's what I am by profession. I also own this beautiful space called the Life Store. It's quite nice, yeah. I call it a wellness boutique because health food store sounds so boring. But it really is a health food store with yeah. a little more oomph. So. Health food with a oomph? Yeah, like a You oomph. see how people oomph with that shoulder? <laughs> I think that's fascinating. Well, um, when we spoke about us doing this podcast, it was kind of weird. We were kind of fishing through topics. Mm-hmm. And somehow your life story tied back to one common theme. And that theme was resilience Mm -hmm. so to kick off the podcast i'm going to read a definition of resilience okay um before we go on resilience can be defined as the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties Mm -hmm. toughness the often remarkable resilience of so many british institutions that's using a sentence Um, another definition is the ability of a substance or object to spring back into shape elasticity so nylon is excellent in wearability, abrasion, resistance, and resilience. Right. All right. So so it's like it's that a beautiful bounce, word. Eh? Bounce back ability. Bounce back ability. Yeah. So yeah, I I thought you no, know, say what you're gonna I, say. It's um whenever I think resilience, and it's it is my my favorite word, and it's been my favorite word for a few years now. When I think resilient, something else that comes to mind is persistence. Yeah. Um and flexibility. Yeah. Because I think persistence and flexibility are necessary, but resilience kind of captures it all. Because persistence, you can just be banging your head against a wall, the same wall all the time, just trying to go like go through. Right. Whereas resilience is sort of like a reassessing and a right. The spring back thing just sounds beautiful, yeah. And I figure when you bounce back, you also evolve with each bounce back, probably right. Is Goodness, a hope you versus, would hope so. Versus versus <laughs> persistence, where you may not be getting anywhere. Well, that's the definition of madness. Keep Maybe. doing the same thing over and over and, and expecting a different result. Exactly. Yeah. What I want to do, basically, let's start with your life. I mean, pretty much your life experience will experiences will kind of show us why. You have been resilient. Mm -hmm. So let's start from the top. All right. Let's start from the beginning. Tell us about young Natalie. Young Natalie. um, Where were you born? Well, I was born in Miami, Mm -hmm. but I was one of those babies that mom got on a plane, flew up, had me. (laughs) As soon as I could get back on a plane and come back, I came back. Basically, like all Jamaicans (laughs) did it, right? Yes. All right. So you're you're born in in Miami. Born born. in Miami, but I mean, there's no part of me that's not Jamaican. You know, went to school all my life out here, except for, um, well, boarding school and university. I went away for that. But So primary education, secondary education in Jamaica. Absolutely. And in some tertiary abroad, right? Yep, 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 yep. And I was, you were asking about, tell a, a little bit about young Natalie, really vibrant, really bouncy, like the kid that wouldn't shut up. The story took forever to come out because it just had to go on and on and on, you know? Right. Yeah. So you were a storyteller? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so you were kind of chatty, mouty, happy. Chatty, mouty. Very creative back then too. Like I would come up with stories. So yeah. I would talk stories like it was truth. And that got me into a lot of trouble. Wow, wow. Because people believed you and it wasn't true. Yeah. And then I was like, crap, I'm now in trouble for something that's not real. And they don't believe me that it's not real now. So, yeah, that was funny. 
would you say that um, your childhood was pretty, pretty peaceful and happy for the most part? When did you start like encountering any kind of resistance in the world of life? Like for me, childhood wasn't bad, but I was bullied a lot as a child. Mm. Then it, it continued throughout life, but it always it just got less and less and less and less and less as I learned to figure out people more and more and more and more. Yeah. So I kind of knew how to navigate them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What would you say for you? I am. Um I was always teased. So from I was like almost like my naivety and my innocence in prep school was a big teasing thing. Like I remember these two guys came up to me. Like they were the cool guys, you know, the good looking cool guys. And by the way, we're eight, right? So right, so right. So. Things <laughs> and they're like, hey, Natalie, are you gay? And I was like, yeah, I'm gay. Because in my world. Your gay is happy. Gay was happy. And damn it, if I wasn't happy. And I'm like, ha, <laughs> she's gay, she's gay. And then she ran off and there was this big teasing thing going on. And I'm like, I don't get what just happened. Right. So you so, you miss you miss these things. I but miss they, these they took things. advantage of <laughs> Absolutely. They took advantage of your ignorance in those moments. But yeah, but major that wasn't major resistance. Major resistance came um I think more in the high school I mean, I still continued to be teased because I love to learn. So I was called like nerdily and nofus and all of that stuff. But it kind of didn't bother me. It kind of did, like, you know. Right. But the resistance was a parental resistance where my parents had this very old school image of who Natalie should be and what she should be exposed to. So right. they were very very protective. I lived in this tight little bubble that I wanted to rebel out of all the time and right. rebel i did which is not unusual for a lot of jamaican households no. because i guess we come from a very traditional kind of kind of background um coming back to resistance in childhood you had told me that you were a chubby kid mm -hmm. um which and you're not a chubby <laughs> adult so tell me a little bit about that experience of being man i just chubby. felt like my body wasn't able to like do the things that other people could do like i couldn't run like i would run and be breathless and <laughs> so i was like I'm allergic to PE, which is funny because if you know what's it, you yeah, know, you're right? like all like, about fitness, spinning, right? spinning instructor, mm -hmm. and everything. Um, so I was always chubby, and then the immaculate uniform did not. It's already designed to make you not look attractive. And just for people who are not from Jamaica, it is like a dress. How you decide to describe it? It's a white blouse and skirt, but. The skirt is so pleated that you look like a balloon. Right, and it's like a not a close fitting skirt, is a No, it's not uh, close uh, fitting and it's down to your <laughs> down to your mid calf and it's really frumpy. With a little the blue tie. Maybe the blue tie. Maybe the sisters at Immaculate wouldn't think it's frumpy, but <laughs> It's kind of frumpy. It's kind but, of but hey, uniforms aren't meant to be sexy. <laughs> no, they're not. But this one, this one made me look like a butterball. Wow. Yeah. Butterball, I think of turkeys. Yeah. <laughs> but were you teased for not being um, athletic and for being chubby at that time? Or that was just My how you were? My dad teased me a lot. Okay. He teased me a lot, especially when I went away to school and put on more weight yeah. and came back and he's like, I never sent you away to boarding school to go and get fat. <laughs> well, what the heck's been going on? Right. Yeah. So that was a thing. And I think... I mean, low key, maybe that sort of influences how I see myself now. Because I always, even if I'm thin and athletic built looking, whatever, There's I still feel, of, yeah. Yeah. I feel fat. You still feel fat. And yeah. it's coming from that, that deep rooted kind of. Maybe. I mean, I haven't dug through it with a therapist or anything, <laughs> but maybe. <laughs> but you know, I actually feel that way about many things. And I even have a couple of friends now who are very muscular. They were very skinny guys and they became muscular. And men hardly talk about this stuff. Mm -hmm. But in my assessment, I feel like they are still the skinny guys they were. Mm. So no matter how big they get their personality still reflect the insecurities of a skinny person who will be picked on. Right. And it's, it's, in, it's a deep thing. It's a really deep we thing. We need a shrink on this. <laughs> All right, so you went from prep school to high school. Mm -hmm. And then from high school, what happened after high school? Um, I had applied to universities, gotten scholarships, taken SAT, gone off and gotten all of these. Like, I, was, I was 16, graduated from Immaculate, and I was going to university. And my father was like, where the heck you think you're going at 16? Yeah. Um, so by this point, my sister really wanted to go to boarding school. I don't know where she got that into her head. She's two years younger than I am. Yeah. So they sent us away together to boarding school. So that was sort of the compromise that I got to go away and not do sixth form in Jamaica. So I basically did sixth form in Canada. All right. So that um, was when you moved over. That right. was when I moved over. Why Canada? Because my dad thinks the moral system in the United States is severely lacking. 
And he thought that then. <laughs> and he thought that then. <laughs> so well, well. No offense to anyone. No, right? American. <laughs> Want to keep my visa. <laughs> <laughs> but he felt that the Canadian system was more aligned with our British system. All right. So, I think that's yeah. that's probably true too. And it worked nice. It was good. It was good. So you and your sister are living in what kind of? You guys are living together with family, or are you on your no, own? No man, we're in a boarding school. B- boarding school, right? Straight so you, up boarding so yeah, school, so outside mm-hmm. like Hogwarts. So, What's that like? Yeah. What was it like? Um. Do you know it was really cool because now I didn't have the parental clause in me. One, yeah. And um, the Canadian, although they are not like all out there, there still was. There, I mean, boarding school is like a great mid ground, I should say, between um, the controlling parameters of home and complete absolute freedom of university. So we we had we had little. The bonus were expanding, which was nice. Um, you got you met girls from all over the world. I mean, I, I literally remember a girl sitting down in her room. There must have been something like depressed, some sort of psychological. But she would sit down sharpening a knife on a whetstone and look out her bedroom door as I walked by. And I was like, this is scary. And then there was drugs. Yeah. Well, and mm-hmm. all sorts of things. So we were exposed to a lot of things. You found yourself being tempted to go go there at that time? or No, man. Mm-mm, not at all. Um, what we did was we did, we did like, we played with the edges and like we would sneak out to order pizza. Right, you know, like right, we found right, a way right. to sneak out of the boarding school dorm itself, find a telephone that still worked and order pizza and then met the guy in the bushes. And I mean, so no, it was innocent. But, but yeah, nothing too well. Nothing you too could hear well. your Jamaican parents no. in the head. That's why. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that is actually when I started smoking cigarettes, though. Yeah. Because we would sneak out, go to the Beckers up the road. One girl had fake ID because you need ID to buy cigarettes. Right. She would buy cigarettes and we'd sit in the bus stop and smoke. How stupid is that? But I wanted to fit in. And that's what they did. So. Right, right. We're working yeah. through your story because we're going to really come down to, to why there's resilience tied into this. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I know the listeners might be like, where are we going to this? Where People are, are like, I smoke. People are like, I've traveled. Um, but so after boarding school, where are we moving to next? Then we went to university. We mm-hmm. went to University of Guelph. Many people are not familiar with the University I think you of can Guelph. Spell, I can spell that. I may have seen the word G U E G U E L P H. That's correct. Nice. Yeah. What were you doing then? Um, I studied management, it's a really long title, Management Economics in Industry and Finance. Right. So, management Economics. I got, I got a Bachelor of Commerce. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And Did wh- not want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> what were you thinking about um, passionately versus what you were actually doing physically? Oh, I wanted to study marine biology. I mean, when I went away to boarding school and I met like, like super labs. Right. No disrespect to the Jamaican schools, but right. it was almost like I was in a different world now. And the bio lab just blew me away and the study of genetics. And it was phenomenal. And I was like, wow, I love this and I love diving. I've been a diver since I'm 13. So I thought I want to marry the two and study marine biology. And my father was like, send you to school to go and be a glorified beach bum. I think not. Yeah. He says you need to go learn how to manage money. So I was like, damn it. Okay. <laughs> Economics so, so even <laughs> even at this stage in life, the parents still have, but that's that's typical. They still have a bit of a stronghold over the direction that a that you're bit? trying trying to go. No in. man, they were forever in my like entire being. They were always there. And at this point in time, I would imagine you're probably in your twenties, right? Um, at this or point, close. I'm eighteen. Or, right, you are eighteen. You are a young college student. Yes. This is this is the beginning. Yep, eighteen, nineteen. Would you say you had um? You remember any significant challenges in the in the college journey? So in this part of it, in terms of anything significant happened to you that? Yeah, man. Oh, gosh. University brought a whole set of challenges because we, we actually in boarding school started drinking as well. Right. So we would um, we would sneak out. We had fake ID. We would sneak out and go to bars in the like the latter years of boarding school. So this whole love affair, hate, love thing going on with alcohol started back then. And it continued into university. So we'd go on pub crawls and all sorts of things. Um, And there was one in my final semester of first year. There was a situation where... We drank too much, and drank, drinking too much was not uh, unusual. Uh, not unusual thing. in college. It, no. it <laughs> happened all the time. But um, I woke up the next morning and realized that somebody had taken advantage of me, and I knew exactly who it was. It was not something that was wanted. It was not something that I would have ever sanctioned. And I spoke to some friends about it, and they were like, "That's date rape." You know, that's exactly what happened. So I went and I reported it to the police and they basically said, sorry, you know, and it was a female police, which really bugged me. It was a female campus police officer. And she's like, 
it doesn't make sense pursuing this. And I was devastated. I mean, this is not what I had wanted at all. I was able to be excused from all of my exams because the professors knew like the turmoil that I was going through. Right. And um, I actually came home for summer and had zero intention of going back to school because you I just was didn't so, want to go back into the space. I was so uh, devastated. And this was a guy that you knew? It was a guy who was a friend of my roommate. Acquaintance. So, yeah. Yeah. In the context of that, not to dig it up too much, mm-hmm. but when I was in college, people used to talk about blackout drunk and white girl wasted and all these mm-hmm, kind of mm-hmm. things. You were in a state where you didn't really know what was going on because mm-hmm. of alcohol. And not yeah. at all. I literally passed out in my bed with my door closed. Oh, wow. But they yeah. were in the same space. He, it, how I lived was I had what was called a brick double. So my roommates had a bigger space. I had like a little closet off to the side. So I had my own private room with a door, with a, with a door that closed. So I went to my bed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think um, the resilience <laughs> kind of starts here. Well, it, st- it started a long time ago, yeah. but this is like kind of something that was challenging. All yeah. right. So, but you did go back to school. I did. I did. I did. And I dug through and um, there was there was significant scarring from that situation that took place and it lasted a very long time. Yeah. I don't want to like go all Dr. <laughs> Phil on you, but I mean, how, how would you say it um, changed your relationship with men at the time oh i could i thought i was worthless like i thought i was um i didn't think i was worthy of like a proper relationship so right. unfortunately after that i had a series of like casual affairs like just one night stands because right. i was like i was now like the damaged goods like i didn't think i was it's interesting that special. that how we um internalize experiences like that that something was done to you but instead of actually saying that the other person did it, which is what happened. You actually thought that you were the problem. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah, yeah. And I guess you've changed that perspective now. Boy. <laughs> <laughs> you can't, or, and, and continue to. Continue to. All right, take me into the next phase. So college ended. College ended. I'm yeah. assuming college, not too many other things happened after that. Where did you move <laughs> after college? <laughs> no, I, um, I actually stuck around Guelph because... Um, what I got what even happens in Guelph? <laughs> Uh, you Guelph know, is a person or a place? It's a place. Right. It's a small town. I mean, I don't know what it is now. I've not been back. Guelph 2.0. <laughs> <laughs> like it's a it's a small town with farmers markets and Guelph was a really interesting space in that it actually has the the demographics of Guelph is pretty representation of wider Canada. So it was used for a lot of testing of different things. So like if the municipal government of Ontario was going to roll out wet dry recycling, they tested it in Guelph. So we actually were on the cutting edge of lots of things that had to do with um, improvements in infrastructure and stuff like that. So right. farmers markets, that's where I met um, a naturopath because I was having like a medical challenge and yeah. I went to a naturopath and I was like, wow, this is wild. Tell me a bit more about that because right now we're in the live store, JA. So I feel yeah. like that may have been a pivotal moment in terms of it really planting was. naturopathy and alternative and holistic care into your head. Naturopathy changed my life. I had this I had this issue that's not uncommon with women and my male doctor said, meh, part of life. Right. Um, you just got to suck it up. That's part of being a woman. And I was like, no, man, like, no, this can't make be any life. Sense, right? mm-hmm. No, not at all. So somebody told me that they had seen a naturopath and I was like, what is a naturopath? Anyways, I went and I saw this woman and never in my life had a doctor taken an hour and a half to sit down and go through a history with me right and it was just i felt i felt heard right it was just incredible and then she told me to take take she thought i was gluten intolerant because of these pains i was having in my stomach and i didn't even hear about gluten i mean this is back in back yeah, in a long yeah, not, time right, ago. Right, exactly no I, I, <laughs> right. I probably barely even know what gluten is right now so you can imagine yeah and i i followed everything that this woman told me to do and we made dietary adjustments we um introduced certain supplements and she would take me through this program and problem went away and never came back till later on in life but it was i got 20 years of clearness from this issue and it was just phenomenal and i thought this is really cool right yeah 20 years of clearness that's pretty um that's pretty like amazing. So at that point, you believed that oh, this yeah. stuff worked. And prior to that, you really, it wasn't that space for you, right? Mm-mm. Mm-hmm. Food was weight. Right, right, right. And, and what tastes good. Health. Uh, right, right, right. Yeah. Wow. All right, where did you move after this? We're going now from Guelph to what's next? This is I came back to Jamaica in 1999. I'd come home. Um, 
I was by now in a pretty, um, well, definitely monogamous on my side. I'm not, you're never really sure about the other person. <laughs> but I was, in a, <laughs> I was in a long relationship with a, with a guy I'd met at the end of university. And of course, like wildly in love and um, was sticking around because of that. So I was working as an investment planner. Um, did my CFP certified financial planner which is like a two-year program and was working basically giving personal financial advice estate planning advice that sort of thing but he was into some shady things that I started to get involved with as well and that's I, so shady <laughs> <laughs> but let's keep going <laughs> and then I came home to visit my family and I was like what the heck and that's not the word I wanted to use. Am mm-hmm. um, I doing with my life? Like you are allowed to curse and talk to it, but you don't. If okay, you want to, but you don't have to. Know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't put bleeps or anything. Okay, we, cool. But, that's but, yeah. good to know. Um, <laughs> so if one slips out, it's all good. Cool. It was yeah. It was a it was a w a big WTF moment. Yeah. And, and I was like, because I saw friends and I saw friends that were involved in their family's companies, and I was like, hold on, this is this is what I should be doing. Like I should be working in my family business at this point. You know, I love my mom and dad. Yes, we've had our issues in the past, but I should not be like doing nefarious things in Canada. So I went back, packed up, moved back to Jamaica, and now we are um, in the year two thousand. And I lasted in the family business about four months before I wanted to kill myself. <laughs> what, 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 what field was, was the family business in? What? Um, we manufacture signs. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and then this is a, a leap from what you were doing. Right. But not, it wasn't, it well, wasn't you could so apply much some of the same things yeah. to the business, but yeah, it wasn't working. Because I'm out. really flexible when it comes to like, I, not, I can, I'm pretty much, if you give me a task to do, I pretty much apply excellence. Like I'm good at, a lot of things so I could fit in but the emotions of what was going on in there I couldn't manage that was draining so I um, got a job at Citibank and moved over into banking and this is here in Jamaica here Citibank in Jamaica, in Jamaica right yeah and that there there began my 16 year career in banking so my yeah. question to you um, we know where you are now mm-hmm. and we knew you liked marine biology mm-hmm. how were you able to go through all of those studies and work in these fields that were not lighting your soul on fire for so long. What, what, I mean, a lot of us do it, but. You tell yourself stories, you know, and the story that you tell yourself, which is not a bad story at all, because we need stories to get through life. Yeah. Um, is that my work facilitated the life I wanted to live. And in my twenties and in my thirties, that was okay. So I worked nine to five, Monday to Friday, I did not work late. Yeah. Right? And that was a Citibank culture and I didn't subscribe to it. So f- I left. Yeah. And when Blackberry came out, I didn't check it till the next day. And I was, I mean, I know the senior management might have been concerned about that, but that was just what I had to do to protect me. That was your boundary. Yeah. I had to set up the boundaries. So, so work, work salary, facilitated life. and you could do your job well and yeah, yeah and, and you got to live your life. Yeah. Citibank allowed you to travel a bit, right? Yeah, man. They would send us all over the place for various training courses. And that was really cool. That's how I saw Brazil. Yeah. Um, yeah. Nice. So overall, though, even though you may not have been perfectly aligned, you were happy? Yeah, I was happy. Yeah. I was happy. But then, then I think when you reach a certain level of self-actualization, you, you reach a place where you don't want work to facilitate your life. You want to live your life. Right. You want to be aligned with your truth and living in your light and all of these like and fabulous, glorious have things. Have a purpose and a passion. Right. I always wonder, I when you work in a purpose. bank, do you feel purposeful? <clears throat> I guess it depends on what drives you. I mean, I know a lot of people that felt purposeful. Yeah. And there were, there were periods of time where I did, like when I was, um, especially like, I think my favorite thing to do there was when I was the money market manager and I was managing the bank's liquidity. And that was really cool. Like I would, you know, what position is the bank closing off in at night? Do I need to borrow money from the Bank of Jamaica, lend money? I mean, it was just, that was a lot of fun and I enjoyed that. Right. Um, What's a big responsibility, I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There was, there was like one major mistake that happened there and I went in the next morning fully ready to resign. I was like, I'm sorry. I think I'm yeah, out of I'm, here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I got the lecture that people make mistakes. And this can happen. And what are you going to learn from it? And this can happen. Right. And yeah. Um, but I, I reached a point where I didn't, like it was now beginning to wear on my soul. Yeah. And I didn't like that. So How did that end? 
Um, well, it ended very l- longly. <laughs> it took a long time to end. Yeah. It was, um, you know, somebody told me in a course I took once that indecision is the worst form of self-abuse. Wow. And I lived in a space of indecision oh, for gosh, about two that li- years. Libras are indecisive. Yeah. Space of indecision <laughs> for two years. <laughs> I've been abusing myself. <laughs> yeah. I cried a lot yeah. at my desk. Um, I felt like I, I just no longer felt right and I felt like I couldn't keep up and I felt like my boundaries weren't sufficient and it was a really bad space and I never kept it from my supervisor you know like right these so were you conversations. Let, them, let them know so they knew what you were dealing they with. knew what we were dealing with but at this point now in my personal life I was married um I had two kids so I had a lot to think about you know in terms of I couldn't just be carefree and eh, I don't love this anymore peace out yeah I couldn't just do that. So it took a long time. And then you go through like, okay, so I'm, I've now taken a course in health coaching. I've now been coaching a few people on the side. So I'm finding my passion yeah. outside of the official work sphere. Can I make that leap? All right. I'm glad you mentioned this. So, so you just dropped a couple of bombs in there. Okay. <laughs> so you did your health coach training while at Citibank. Yes. So you were still there. Yes. What was your reason for doing it? And what did you hope to achieve in doing that? Um, always looking for, I was always looking for plan B. Yeah. Like plan A, I knew wasn't, I was not going to retire at 65 from banking. So I was always on the lookout. Um, I would have loved to go back to school and study medicine because I love the human body and how yeah, it works. Yeah. And, um, so you had an awareness that this wasn't it. Oh, yeah. I knew that wasn't it. Uh, but I couldn't with the kids and the Ray Ray and the husband and the mortgage. and like Med school just wasn't going to happen for me. At least that's a story I told myself. I'm sure it could. But um, when you ask the universe and you're open to what's going to come to you, yeah. sometimes it hits you over the head. So this, I'd never heard of health coaching before ever. And... But three or four different people told me about this program. And then you know how Google is. Google is like this. It sees inside your head. Big brother. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Always watching. <laughs> so all of a sudden, Google keeps throwing these ads at me about this, um, this school called Institute for Integrative Nutrition, which just so happened to be the school that I had two friends that went to. And they were in love with the program. So I was like, all right. I remember being on the floor in my bathroom with the last charge on my cell phone because Hurricane Sandy is coming. And I'm like, come hell or high water, I'm going to enroll in this program because the universe has sent it to me like from six different angles over the past three months. So storm blowing outside, storm blowing in my heart. I call him up, I register and I'm like, okay, I'm doing this. You traveled or distance learning? Distance learning. Wow. And I fell in love it was i was like this is what i've been looking for all my life i think those revelations are always very (laughs) exciting (laughs) and divinely timed divinely timed tell me about marriage marriage was amazing in the beginning like i loved this person so much that i didn't think i could love them anymore and then when we got married I love them more. It was just, it was, it was incredible. But I think there were, there were things that I was blind to or things that I saw, but thought would never be turned on me. Right, 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 right. And I think my parents saw it. Yeah. And that's why they were kind of like in the beginning, are you sure this is where you want to be? But, you know, stubborn like a rock. Yeah. Um, you went through it, in eh? Yeah, man. And were loyal to the cause. Absolutely. And I was a very good wife for, I think, the first maybe three quarters of the marriage. How long were you married? Approximately. Nine years. Okay, yeah. But we were dating for four before. Okay, so somebody had been so, with for a while, yeah. Yeah, man. We'd been, we'd been together for a while. Um, but eventually, the um, you can't ignore things, even if they're little things. Yeah, yeah, And yeah. I ignored the little things. And you can't think... A person is a person, and how they do one thing is how they do everything, you know. And he's a great guy, and we get on really well, and we co-parent from a distance really well. So I'm grateful for all of that. But to be, for me to be able to plug in my faith and trust and energy into right. that anymore, I just couldn't. So that took a long time. And by the time I'm thinking of leaving the work, yeah, I'm also at the same time thinking of leaving the marriage. Right. All right. So all this is happening together. Yeah. And, 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 you are, <laughs> and you have two kids and you're thinking about moving again. Well, at this point, I had three kids. Yeah, three now, right. Yeah. So, all right. So all of this is happening. <laughs> um, all right. So from what we're saying, so did you leave the marriage? 
I did. Yeah, so the marriage ended. Yeah. And the work ended too. The work ended too. What was the next move? Well, the first thing was the realization that I survived it all. Yeah. Like, as hard as it was, I survived it all. And um, the next move was I was full time health coaching, teaching spinning, running my detox programs, and loving life. Yeah. Struggling financially. <laughs> But. but all of a sudden, that was like less important because I kind of plugged into this belief system that it would come if I kept doing the right things and applying the right principles and being the best me I can be and getting results with my clients and, you know, it will come and it's but now you're being slowly. no, but, but now you're being driven and led by purpose and passion and not by money. And yeah. not that we should make money, yeah. but but um, I feel like it should start there all the time. Yeah. But you not only made it through marriage and a job that you probably stopped loving as much, mm-hmm. but um, you're a diving mm-hmm. instructor. I'm what? a dive master. You're a dive master. Yeah, but I never worked in the field. I just got it because I like to take things. I'm a lover of learning. So I, I took it to the extreme. You had a diving incident. I tell did. Me, tell, tell us about <laughs> that. And then after diving incident, tell us about becoming a spinning instructor. Um, all right. The diving incident was I was covering a dive. I was studying to be a dive master. So basically I had to work in a shop. So I was working in a shop in Runaway Bay. And that was really cool. And I was, I was covering a dive. And I did not have one of those noisemakers on my tank to call out to somebody. So I see somebody floating up and you can't come up higher than your smallest bubble right because then you'll get what's called the bends because mm-hmm. the liquid nitrogen is a gas in your system mm-hmm. in your veins and it'll form a bubble and lodge somewhere and cause issues so guy starts popping up i'm trying to get his attention inexperienced i don't empty out my tank inexperienced as a dive master so i'm thinking about the other person and not about me i don't empty out all the air out of my bc so i start to come up a little too fast too and before i know it the two of us have surfaced and surfaced like unaware and uncontrolled right which is a dangerous thing but i didn't think anything of it we went back down we finished the dive next morning i'm washing my face and i'm getting soap in my eye and i'm thinking that's weird later in the day i'm trying to whistle and i'm good at doing the finger whistle because i'm trying to call one of the boat guys and it's like not (laughs) not happening and i don't understand what's going on till i look in the mirror and i see half my face slumped i was like and oh. as a doctor, I would probably want to say something like Bell's palsy when you think of it. But as a diver, you know what's hap- what has happened or you didn't realize at the time. I didn't really realize at the time. As a matter of fact, my mom got so freaked out. She put me on a plane and took me up to Miami, which is the worst thing you can do. And even the dive master, the, right, the, dive, the, of the medical altitude. Mm-hmm. officer there said, um, boy, not sure if it's decompression sickness or Bell's palsy. Okay. But either way, they were going to throw me in the chamber and I was in the chamber for three days right right, balling my eyes out because they said that i should probably never dive again because if i hit the same if it was decompression sickness and if i hit the same nerve twice it could be permanent so have you dived again since yeah (laughs) (laughs) but you don't ever come up fast i don't and i don't go as deep i'm very careful right and i actually my um my eldest daughter she became a certified diver as well. And it's that thing that we share together. So that's our special time. We go on a dive every so often. Very safe, very controlled, always with us to shop, never on our own. And um, it's our thing. Yeah, that's super cool. Yeah. It's like, I mean, I don't have any kids yet, but it's nice to share things with kids. Yes. Um, so you mentioned your mom. And um, mm-hmm. I know she's no longer with us. Right. So you've lost a parent, which is another huge thing in life for anybody. Yep. Um, what was that like for you? That was, um, man, that was, that was intense because mom, mom was a diabetic for 30 years. Yeah. Right. So, and knowing all that I knew and not being able to help her because you can't help someone if they don't want help. Right. Yeah. So just watching her deteriorate was really difficult. Um, and if you, if you know diabetes, it changes a person's personality, not just their physiology. And so she became a very difficult person to deal to with. Deal with yeah. uh, and I just had to keep telling myself, it's her, not me. Just keep doing what, you know, control yourself. So when she was in a bad place, I'd be like, mom, I can't do this right now. I'll come back when this part of whatever you're going through is over um, emotionally. So, but then the, um, I actually was scheduled to, to teach a big ride 
because I would do these journey rides as a spinning instructor now. And I also had a detox group, a 30 day group starting and I had about 10 people in the group and then mom died. And this was during the Chick V outbreak and they were all like, like the clients all said, if you need time. Yeah, just do what you have to do. But I couldn't let them down because the reason she died was reasons that I needed to help them. You know, yeah. so the ride, I changed it and I actually called the ride Resilience. This is a thing. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the photograph that I used to promote the ride was a sunflower growing out of a crack in a pavement. Yeah. You know, because you find. Yeah, say it. <laughs> no, I'm just getting emotional. Uh, <laughs> you find your um you find your space where you can yeah. to just to come back, no matter how hard the environment is. So So that seed is able to break through that crack and pre- yeah. and, and create something beautiful yeah. through a hard surface. Yep. 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 And that's resilience. And that's resilience. Yeah. <laughs> are taking you are taking you still to the next level and again this is because you provided me with information that the uh-huh. listeners don't have but um you and your father have a pretty close relationship now and you still have him around but tell me a little bit about him and what's oh, yeah. going on with him okay we're really drawing I know. Um, we're really drawing you can sit down <laughs> i'm sorry <it's> a <laughs> terrible host <laughs> um yeah, so after mom's death, dad and I became a lot closer because I think she, I think she kind of buffered that relationship between us. Yeah. And as an adult, your relationship with your parents evolve. Definitely. Um, I know that sounds kind of like, duh, of course it evolves. But yeah, it really it, evolved. It, yeah, it, it, and I don't think you can appreciate it until you're experiencing it. Yeah. You just, you don't know what it's going to become. <laughs> That's the truth. And, yeah. you know, my dad is the one that actually started teaching me about the proper ways of eating from little right. you know and he had this vitamin bible and so anytime something was wrong with us he'd be like oh you need to take more <laughs> less thing you need some brewer's yeast like he was very much a natural healer and a bushman and all of right, things. Right. so anyways we after mom passed we got a lot closer and just before she passed we realized that he had prostate cancer so we started dealing with it um, he did surgery, he did whatever he needed to do. And then she passed. And I think he protected us for a little while from the fact that it had come back. And then eventually he felt like letting us into that secret. Right. So now... Which I'm glad he did. Yeah. No, I'm, you're glad that he let us into the secret. I am. People yeah. hold, some people hold on to that, to the, to the bed. Yeah, to the end. Which is not, no, <laughs> not good. So um, now a lot of time, you know, now, now we've had to go away with him and do his radiation and his this and his that and it's progressing and it's scary because i'm not ready yeah 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 nobody's ever ready (laughs) nobody's ever ready but you are appreciating and enjoying all of him yeah man making like despite the the misery (laughs) that he comes with sometimes but now when there's a choice between what to do i make sure and get him in there because and the kids my kids we spend a lot of time visiting papa and you know what's beautiful about this? Um, I only met one of my grandparents and mm. it was my father's mom. She died at 92 from a stroke and that's the only one that I knew. Mm-hmm. I may have been alive while some of the others, but I was so young that when they died, I didn't really get to experience them. So um, it's kind of cool that the kids get to, to yeah, have man. a relationship with him. For sure. Um, let's hop out of this. So okay. <laughs> you are now and have been for a while an entrepreneur with mm-hmm. you spinning, but now you are have run this store you mm-hmm. run you are running this store <laughs> yeah. called life store ja um tell me about the store what the store does what it means to you to to have evolved to this point where you are i think pretty very aligned you're so aligned i i am so aligned and i'm so happy um despite being scared and i think you should do things that, that scare, scare you, you absolutely what's time. the point what's the point of That's living a boring mundane no. life without without anything that will cause you to change and grow Absolutely. So one of my favorite things to do when I travel yeah. is go into like a health food store, even supermarkets, just because I just love how big the aisles are, how bright it is, how it smells nice in there, how there's so many cool things. And so Whole Foods is like my Disney World. And yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I used to go in there too when I was in Boston. Yeah. So I, as a health coach, I'd always be saying to people, okay, you need to go and take your probiotics. You need to take, um, you need some more da da da, whatever. Yeah. And I would send them off to other places to go buy them. And I was like, so hold on. 
Because there's a merchant in me from I'm small, right? The merchant of Natalie. Oh, gosh, yeah. <laughs> the merchant <laughs> in Natalie. <laughs> the merchant in Natalie. <laughs> and I was like, so why I can't sell anything? So, so my, um, again, my dad, you know, my parents are a really strong influence in my life. My dad said this plaza is going up. It's almost finished. There's a one spot left. Um, and my dad did the signs for the plaza. Oh, so he knew, yeah. So he knew. He's in, he, he's in touch with the guy. And uh, he says, you should put in a bakery. Because bakery make money. Because people buy baked goods. And I was like, like dude. I'm not, I'm not baking anything. Are you not? Like, <laughs> do you not know what I do? <laughs> right. Do you not know what I love? <laughs> so I said, but I'll take the spot. Yeah. And I'll open a store. Yeah. And I'll sell the things that I want people to use to live their best life. Yeah. So the intention out of this space is to provide you with all elements of holistic living. So from your cleaning products, because it's important what you clean your home with, yeah. to what you put in your body, the food, to what you put on, on your, skin, your body. Yes. Yeah. Um, so and then an awareness of the environment, because we can't just care about us. We have to care about how we impact right. the world. Right. Um, so that's what we do here. We provide all the elements of holistic living. Yeah, truly holistic. Yeah. So. I love it. And um, and I know that with it will come challenges because entrepreneurship, let me tell you, they say it's not for everybody. Listen to me now. But, but My opening it, February. <laughs> yes. And then what you can't happened? Even, you can't even launch because of, uh, I mean, a formal launch because of a pandemic. COVID coming so two weeks later. Uh, Watch this. <laughs> so what I'm going to do to you right now might be weird because I know that when we sit within ourselves, we don't really think of our lives like a bullet point mm -hmm. of, of, of things. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to run through the things that you said to me. Mm -hmm. Self-esteem issues, chubby kid, not athletic, being teased, called nerdily, diving, um, having the bends, alcohol, relationship with alcohol, smoking, date rape, um, breakups, divorce, uh, leaving a stable job, single parenting, to health coach, loss of a parent, parent with a chronic illness, and I did that because I couldn't do this at the beginning of the episode, but I feel like there will always be listeners who feel like what makes you unique. And everybody goes through challenges. Um, our point was to sit in resilience. And you've been through a lot of experiences. Some of them brought to you. Mm -hmm. Some of them maybe caused by you. Mm -hmm. Some in the middle. Let's sit on the word resilience. Let's talk about it. Um, looking back, mm -hmm. why are you resilient? Well, I want to go back a little bit further. Yeah, man, take me where you want to. And, <laughs> and um, everything is caused by you. Wow. Everything. And until we recognize, uh, and it's not a blame thing, mm -mm. but until we take ownership of the cause, we can never be resilient and we can never grow we can't blame other people so i can't say it's because i drank too much or because the alcohol that i got raped i have to take responsibility for the drinking yeah right had you not had that much alcohol you would have been coherent enough to perceive exactly. that this could have happened so and things do not happen to us we cause things whether on purpose by accident subconsciously whether our energy draws things into our space so we have to take um, we have to take ownership or we will not grow. You believe in internal locus of control. You've heard this term. Yikes. A wonderful, okay. no, a wonderful <laughs> um, podcast uh, marketer, um, Stephen Bartlett. I listen to his podcast every day, all the time. And he talks about people who believe in internal versus external locus of control. Okay. And is what you said. An internal locus control is that the things that happen in my life come from me. I have control over them. I determine them, but not that people cause, cause them to happen. Yeah. And I'm the same. So I can relate to this. We're responsible. We are. And, we are. And, and it doesn't matter if something bad happens. We just have to be resilient and bounce back. Yeah. So you have sex with somebody you shouldn't have you got pregnant. Can't blame them. Both of you do it. And now you're pregnant. <laughs> I know you have a child. <laughs> exactly. But you also were in the bed. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, but anyway, yeah. you were, so you were saying. So you take responsibility for it. Yeah. And then um, self-awareness. So yeah. an, an understanding of, of where I am and why it was that I caused that. Yeah. You know, but um, 
there's sort of a constant burning and a desire for excellence and for greatness and for happiness, you know, and the, the realization that your happiness depends on you and no external factor. No person can make you happy. The kitty cat don't make you happy. The pretty baby don't make you happy. That your happiness is coming from you. So when you recognize that you cause everything, that you're responsible for your own happiness, that you have a burning drive for excellence and for bringing forth, you know, um, an impact into the world, then you have to be resilient. So you have to constantly um, assess what just happened, what's going on, how do I make it bigger and better next time? How do I make me bigger and better next time? Yeah. And keep your level of, like that midpoint level, just keep it left of center or right of center. You know, just keep it always on the up. So on that, the up, right. Yeah, because everybody gets you, knocked down, but right. you can't unpack, move in and say, hey, this is home. You have to keep coming back. And I like that you said that because the flip side could be people who spend the majority of their life not assessing in a space where they're unhappy, not trying to improve. And yeah, I, I, I would love to say I would love to say, but that's okay. But I don't think it's okay. I think if yeah. you're comfortable and happy in a certain space, fine. But there's some things that you need to be yeah. aware of. And yeah, but hey, it's hard. It's hard to tell someone that who is not in that mindset. There's something you have to grow into. Yeah, I think I think people just need to expose themselves also to the fact that there is a higher power. Yeah. And I don't want to go all religious or spiritual on you, but whether your higher power is God, whether your higher power is a creator, a universe, an energy, uh, whatever you call your higher power, you have to recognize that there is a force outside of you and you have to tap into that force and plug into that force. And whether it's through prayer or meditation, but drifting through life with an unconsciousness yeah you will just drift through life and you may be satisfied and that may be okay for you but if you want if you want growth for yourself if you want an impact on the world for yourself you don't do it alone you have to you have to believe that where you are today is exactly where you're meant to be and that you control where you go from there i love it at what point in life did you realize that you're resilient because I'm sure you had to become aware. Of the, the, the realization that I was resilient came when my mom died and I didn't crumple. Yeah. Yeah. Had you thought the experiences prior had led to that or, or you never tied it all up? Yeah, man. Every single experience that you have in life, whether it's good or bad, brings you to where you are today. Every single experience contributes to who you are. Every experience shapes you. Would you say there are any resources or books or things that you read that contributed to your resilience? Anything that stands out to you that you thought was like a, a, a nice push to, to make you? Yeah, throughout my life, people have lent me or encouraged me to read some of the most amazing things that take me through leaps and bounds. Um, my dad gave me the seven habits of highly effective people. Yeah. Um, my dear friend, Sunita, who owns Afia Yoga Studio, she gave me Louise Hayes, You Can Heal Your Life. Um, my aunt used to give me a whole bunch of books on reincarnation and spirituality and just kind of opened up my mind to the fact that there was something else, yeah. something broader. And I, I have a really good friend now, Dwayne, who constantly is throwing books at me. And just, I think, I think you have to expand your awareness. Yeah. Biology of Belief by Bruce Lipton is another phenomenal book that I've I actually listened to because that's what Dwayne does. He challenges me to listen to He's books. He's an audio book person. He's an yeah. audio. I'm a, I'm a visual, but I'm giving it a go. <laughs> <laughs> do you think everyone is resilient? Absolutely. Or should I say, do you, well, I know everybody has the potential to be everybody resilient. Everybody has a potential. But do you think everybody is resilient? No. I think some people, um, I think some people let life happen to them. And it's to me, it's really sad to see in a person um somebody who is quite kind of like their spark has gone out i'm smiling not because it makes me happy but because i felt really like crying a while ago <laughs> actually i feel like crying right now too it touches my soul yeah. because I, I, and it's actually me thinking of people who i know yeah and actually the moments when my spark was gone yeah yeah i'm not just thinking about other people i oh, i've had yeah. the moments when and I, it's funny we're talking about resilience because i always say to people the hardest thing about remaining present mm -hmm. and showing up in life is maintaining it and that maintain the maintenance Gosh, is the resilience yeah yo sometimes i tell you some days i'm just not ready to pop up again some even weeks, though i know what i'm I not I love. ready to pop up again but that's the resilience the bounce back yeah 
Yeah. You know what I find helps me too? When I make an external commitment because I do not break my external commitments. Neither do I. Yeah. I'll, break, I'll break a commitment to myself sooner than to you. Me too. So my spin classes, Yeah. I tell people, I, I thank my students every morning they come for coming because it's their coming that gets me there. And I'll wake up and go, oh, it's four o'clock. Do I have to do this? And, and I'm like, like yeah. well, what if one person shows up? Yeah. And I go there and I teach the class and I bring so much energy because I have to bring energy for them. And then by the time I'm done, I feel good. You know, it's just so my, my spin classes, my commitment to that makes me feel better. So it's about knowing yourself and knowing what's going to bring back your spirit. When, you, when you're down, how do you change a channel? When yeah. you're down, what do you do to flip it and bring yourself back up again? I don't even think I need to ask you to summarize. But in, in closing, what would be your final words to the listeners, viewers about resilience or anything else you want to share with them about this conversation that we've had today? Um, that uh, not, to let, not to let the external events in life impact you and get you down. That shit's going to happen. Like it's inevitable yeah. how you look at everything. And it's not that happy go lucky, like positive thinking attitude, but how you respond to the things in your life is what's important. So if something happens and gets you down, give it the time that it's necessary. Grieve if you have to grieve, but don't don't move in down there. Find something that's going to bring you back. For me, soca music. If I'm down for too long, I fling on some soca music and I'm like, ah, life is good again. So find the things that bring you joy and infuse that joy into your life because your excellence will not come if you are, if you give in and like give up. Then yeah, you're if not you're gonna resonating bring in this space of low energy. Yeah. Oh, that was so well said. Deep, right? <laughs> Natalie Moore, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you for sharing so much of your life in You're a public welcome. forum. Um, I know it's a big deal. And I always go into the podcast telling people, don't share anything that you don't want the world to hear. Yeah. But I also appreciate the value of sharing truth because I think truth helps people to heal. Mm -hmm. Truth helps people to recognize that they're not alone. Alone. Yeah. And that's huge in this big ass world. Natalie, how can people find you? How can people find the Life Store? Where are you? They should come in here and buy some CMOS. <laughs> they should. <laughs> I should come in here and buy some CMOS. <laughs> this is coming from somebody who is not really aligned with all of this stuff, even though I'm a doctor. <laughs> so I'm learning as well. CMOS is awesome. Same thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> NatalieMurray.jm on Instagram. Yeah. That's my coaching page. The Life Store JA on instagram it's for the store it's for the store the wellness boutique the wellness boutique well, yeah and um, and we're physically located at 144 constant spring road that's the new plaza that went up near the tax office at immaculate that's right yeah natalie thank you so much for your time and um bye <laughs> <laughs> that's what the, that's for the listeners bye, bye y'all <laughs> You just listened to episode number 45 of Talk Truth. You done know already. I'm your boy, Mario Evan. And I want you guys to go check out Natalie's store online because you can go there too. Or if you're in Jamaica, please head over to 144 Constant Spring Road and head to the live store. It is, as she said, a wellness boutique where you can experience wonderful stuff. Anything that really is in the health, food, world of life. You probably can find it there. So head on over there and get your goodies. Yum, yummy, yummy. And as usual, please, please, please share this episode with a friend if you really were moved by it. I want you to subscribe to my YouTube channel, which is at Mario Evan. And I want you to also subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast app that you use to listen. Or head over to TalkTruthJA.com and listen there. But on that website is a tab that is said that says subscribe. And when you head there, it will lead you to many different podcasting apps that you can you can check out and download on your phone and keep. Um, apps are the best way to listen because it marks your spot. If you stop listening, it's not like playing a file from a web browser where if you stop at a spot, it's going to have to start over. Or if your phone goes off or goes to sleep, it stops podcast apps are the way to go i use google Podcasts. apple users would probably use apple Podcasts, but there's so many more all right so now that i've convinced you to download a podcast app listen like subscribe share and please leave a review we love reviews reviews help us to know what's popping and help the world helps the world to know what's popping as well so um social media tlk trth we're now talk truth without the vowels 
and only the website is talktruthja.com so find us like us you know what to do until next time folks enjoy the rest of your season next time i see you we'll be on the other side of this year we'll be in 2021 and we'll talk over there all right what good <laughs>